Sometimes I lose track of time when I'm out enjoying nature, at least the one or two times a year I go outside. But computers can't afford to lose track of time. And lucky for them, there's this, the time card. I'm gonna plug this GPS-based atomic clock into a Raspberry Pi Compute Module 4 to make the world's most accurate Raspberry Pi-based clock, a truly atomic Pi. The time card is an open source PCI Express time reference that uses GPS satellites to acquire the exact time down to the tens of nanoseconds. But a GPS signal, like any wireless signal, can't be relied on to be perfect all the time. What do you do to make sure the time stays accurate when the signal drops? Most computers keep time with a quartz crystal, which oscillates at a frequency just under 33 kilohertz. If you have a good circuit and control its temperature, you could hold the time accurate to within a second for maybe 30 days. Well, on the time card, this rubidium atomic clock holds the time accurate to within a second for 32,000 years. How does it do that? Well, at a basic level, it shines a light through rubidium gas inside a chamber, and since rubidium oscillates at a frequency of 6.8 gigahertz, it's more than 200,000 times more accurate than a quartz clock. But when you need this level of accuracy, we're not talking about seconds or years. We're dealing in nanoseconds, which are one billionth of a second. And the time card is accurate to a few billionths of a second, even if you lose satellite coverage for up to two days. And you might be wondering, who cares about billionths of a second? Well, that's understandable. Most people haven't worked in data centers with distributed computing, or in broadcast media where timing is, well, everything. When humans went from sundials to mechanical clocks, schedules could be coordinated better since it was easier to know what time it was any time of day. Computers, even the humble Raspberry Pi, can do billions of calculations in the blink of an eye. You might not care about nanoseconds, but computers do. Most computers use the equivalent of a sundial today, and the time card allows computers to synchronize and coordinate hundreds of times faster. If you want a real-world example of how the time card could help, I've run a service called Server Check-In for over a decade. It uses a set of eight servers all around the world to measure uptime. There's this one dumb server in Chicago that always seems to drift forward in time two seconds per month, and that caused my code to break and distribute more checks to it than my other servers. I had to add in extra code to inject artificial delays so my central database doesn't let Chicago hog everything, since it seems to be running in the future. I also had to add extra automation to adjust the time on that server every night. If all my servers had time cards, or the data center had a central time server with a time card, none of them would ever be more than a few nanoseconds off. And I wouldn't have wasted a week of my life adding that code, which, by the way, makes my application more complicated. Before we dive into it, this card doesn't have any new technology per se. Atomic clocks, even higher accuracy cesium clocks, have been around for decades. And GPS-based timing has been a thing for a while now, too. And many data centers do have specialized time appliances, just apparently not the one I use in Chicago. But this card is to time accuracy as Apple's iPod was to MP3 players before it. It repackages existing technology in a way that's better and easier to use. But unlike the iPod, everything's open source. If you have 1500 bucks and a soldering iron, you could make your own time card with off-the-shelf parts. All you need to run it is a computer with a PCI Express slot. <laughs> Did I mention the Raspberry Pi Compute Module 4 has PCI Express built in? Yeah, we're gonna jam it in a Pi and see what happens. As I get ready to plug it in, let's take a closer look at the hardware on the card. There are three main components. First, this U-Blocks timing board is the brains behind the GNSS satellite timekeeping. It'll work with GPS, GLONASS, Galileo, and Baidu, and it has a GPS antenna connector on it. I plugged in this GPS antenna Facebook sent me and put it near one of my windows so it could get a view of the sky. Next, this metal box contains a miniature rubidium oscillator. This is the most expensive part of the board. <laughs> Just this part alone costs 700 bucks, but that's the price you pay to get accuracy down to billionths of a second. You could swap out this part to save money, or if you wanted even more accuracy, you could wire it up to a cesium atomic clock source, but the price for that might make your eyes water. Redshirt Jeff told me he wants more radiation to, as he said, mess around with, but I don't think I have the budget for it, or the appropriate amount of lead shielding in my walls. The last major part of the board is the FPGA. It's an Artix 7, and it runs the code that exposes the time reference to the computer over PCI Express. This particular model has a gig of RAM built in. 
It's a little weird saying your real-time clock has almost as much RAM as your computer, but here we are. I also asked if there were plans for a flux capacitor for the next board version, but they said they were hard to come by right now because of the chip shortage. <laughs> okay, I guess I'm out of time for bad jokes like that. Moving on. The board has a x4 PCI Express connector, but the I.O. board only has a x1 slot. I could carefully cut the edge of the slot to make this card fit, but in this case, I'll just use this adapter. Let's power up the Pi and see what happens. So far, so good. The blinking lights are a good indication that at least something's working. I booted up a copy of 64-bit PiOS and used LSPCI on the command line to see if the card appeared. And look at that, the Pi can see it. It doesn't have a driver loaded though, and if I look at the dmessage log output from when the Pi started communicating with the card, I don't see any time-specific stuff yet. So the next step is to see if I can get a driver working. First, I tried compiling the driver from the Open Compute Project's GitHub. After fixing a bug in their build script, I tried running it, but it wouldn't work. Apparently, the code in their driver requires a newer version of the Linux kernel than the one that comes with Raspberry Pi OS. Pi OS comes with 5.10, but their code required 5.11 or newer. And I found out that the driver's actually included in the kernel if you use 5.12 or later. I'm kind of used to recompiling the kernel on the Pi, and you can get the shirt for that on redshirtjeff.com, so I decided to build a 5.14 kernel with the time card enabled. I ran menu config and navigated through the kernel options until I found the open compute time card as PTP clock option. I selected that to make sure it was enabled in the kernel configuration, compiled the kernel, copied it to the Pi, and rebooted. Fingers crossed, I waited for the thing to boot up, and once it did, <laughs> look at that. In the dmessage logs, it shows the PTP underscore OCP driver loading successfully. That means the driver I compiled in worked and found the card. So next, I checked the device tree. The FPGA on the time card is supposed to expose two new devices to Linux, PTP0 and PTS, and there they are. The next thing I wanted to see was if I could turn my Raspberry Pi into a grandmaster clock using PTP, or the Precision Time Protocol. If this works, this means a Raspberry Pi and time card could replace expensive proprietary clocks in data centers and could synchronize the clocks for hundreds or even thousands of servers or other devices. You might have heard of NTP, or Network Time Protocol. That's used a lot today, like on your iPhone or laptop, and it can be accurate to a few milliseconds, at least under ideal circumstances. PTP uses hardware-based timestamping and can be accurate to nanoseconds or in some cases even picoseconds. And with a GPS and rubidium clock, a Pi with the time card could be classified as a Stratum 1 time server. This is the most accurate a time source can be outside of GPS devices directly. These other four connectors on the card are also there because of PTP. They can output a pulse per second for an additional level of hardware time verification. But back to the Pi. There's software in the Linux kernel that allows you to run PTP over Ethernet, but the Ethernet adapter has to support it. And here's the interesting wrinkle about the Compute Module 4. The little Ethernet chip it uses is actually different than the one used in the regular boring old Pi 4 Model B. It's a special Broadcom Ethernet controller with built-in PTP hardware timestamping. So let's check if Linux can use it. I ran the command eth tool to see what capabilities the interface has and... Oh, it says it can't do hardware timestamps. <laughs> well, that stinks. I looked into it and apparently the hardware support is there, but the software side hasn't implemented support for this special Broadcom chip. At least not yet. You can follow this GitHub issue to see progress on adding support. So for now, you could still use the time card and get extremely accurate time on the Pi itself and very accurate time over the network using software timestamping or good old NTP. But until that bug is fixed, the Pi can't be set up as a definitive hardware grandmaster PTP clock. So it looks like it may be a little longer before Google, Amazon, Facebook, and everyone else starts adopting the Raspberry Pi as the new time server standard. But I have it on high authority that Facebook engineers have worked directly with Broadcom and the Pi engineers to get this thing working. I have a feeling this won't be my last video on the time card. I haven't even scratched the surface of what you can do with it. How about synchronized motion for industrial automation? Or new audio and video broadcast standards like AAS67 or SEMPTE2110? And how about 5G networking? <laughs> or people who want to sync up live audio equipment with a master clock like in a DAC? Accurate time helps in all these areas today, and current solutions use expensive proprietary hardware. 
Heck, what if every car had a time card in it? Maybe Alec from Technology Connections would finally achieve his dream of every car on the road having synchronized blinkers. Special thanks to Ahmad from Facebook Engineering for sending this card. Also to everyone on his team who's worked on this open source project and made it possible for me to make this video about clocks. It's about time. If you want to learn even more about the time card before I do another video on it, check out the two videos I linked in the description. One by Tech Tech Potato and another by Linus Tech Tips. And finally, right as I started recording this video, I found out about Will Wang's project, which is basically putting the important parts of the time card right onto a Compute Module 4 board. Take a look at this. I'll be following both of these projects pretty closely, but until next time, I'm Jeff Gearling. By the time we finish this, I'll have broken part of this card, I'm sure. Have been around for decades, and GPS-based timing has been a thing for a while now, too. Two. Woo, woo. And here's the interesting wrinkle about the Compute Module 4. <coughs> that is not an interesting wrinkle. That's a burp. Tech tech potato. Tech tech potato. I probably look like an idiot if anybody's watching me right now. All right. Ow, 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 ow. Well, that's a wrap. <laughs>